edit that, but <laughs> sorry, Gianna. Okay, God, I just want to thank you for the opportunity to submit myself to you, to let your voice come through me. So, God, I just pray that I lay myself down and I let you use me as a vessel, and it's your words and not my own. Because I know that there is something here. I know that you're trying to show us something and you're trying to teach us something, and it always just seems like I can only feel it. And it's, I don't want to just feel it, God. I want to be able to speak your words and express your heart the way that it deserves to be expressed. Okay. Amen. Okay, so um, this song that we've been doing, this Teach Me How to Listen is the first line. Teach me how to listen. I want to know your voice. Show me how to wade through living in the natural, rise above the noise. Teach me how your heart beats, tether it to mine. The surgery is worth it. Get below the surface and open up my eyes. I want to see heaven, so let your kingdom come. If faith can wake the dead man and hope can split the sea, then help me to remember the kingdom of heaven is living in me. If death was no match for the resurrected king, then help me to remember the heaven is alive and it's living in me. And then it goes on and it says, I feel the tides are changing. I feel the walls are falling down. I feel the darkness is shaking. We're calling up salvation now. So every time we have done this song, I've just always been like, okay, God, what does that really mean we're calling up salvation now? You know, because like the tides are changing. Like as we keep getting closer to him and we keep submitting to him, and everything is changing, like our whole aspect of the way that we believe, the way that we think, the way that we move, the way everything is changing. And the walls that have held us in bondage, they're falling down. And so the darkness is shaking. But it's like, what is, what is we're calling up salvation now? Like, because we want to, you to teach us how to listen, and we want to know your voice. And we want to know how to wade through living in the natural. But what is this we're calling up salvation now? So, like, as I've been reading, I've been reading a lot all over the place. (laughs) But it's really been, like, God help me. It's really been, like, he's showing me the price that he really paid on the cross. The price that, in my own humanistic words, I can't even express the gratitude or the thanks or the praise that he deserves. And that is that he has made us holy and righteous as he is holy and righteous. And I went home, I talked to Kathy about this, and I went home and I've tried to put everything together and I can't get everything together. And so I'm just going to go through the scriptures and it's like God is showing me like we are kings because we are seated with him. And my eyes are still being open to this. So like this can grow even more than what I'm saying or or can even express. So I'm just going to go through some of the things that he's been showing me, and it's like he's showing me that we're kings, and we are holy, and we are righteous, and um, we're a lord, and we're heirs, and we're his inheritance. And what does that mean? Like, we're his inheritance. So I'm going to start in Colossians. One, and I hope everybody can follow along. If not, just write it down and just, because there's going to be lots of scriptures. And I'll be reading out of the Passion, too. I don't, the Passion translation has just been able to speak to me where the other translation hasn't. 
I always do go back and forth between them, though, and I like to look at the words and the meanings and see, like, what was the truth. But, like, the Passion Translation just, like, shows the heart of God, and so it has just been able to speak to me more, so that's what I'm going to use. So in Colossians 1, 12... Your hearts can soar with joyful gratitude when you think of how God made you worthy to receive the glorious inheritance freely given to us by living in the light. He has rescued us completely from the tyrannical rule of darkness and has translated us into the kingdom realm of his beloved Son. For, the, for in the Son, all our sins are canceled. And we have the, re, and, sorry, and we have the release of redemption through his very blood. So through Jesus hanging on the cross and sacrificing his life, all of our sins are canceled, and we have been released of the debt that we owe are owed, because we don't owe it no more. He is, div- he is the divine portrait, the true likeness of the invisible God, and the firstborn heir of all creation. It's the heir, the firstborn heir. For through the Son, everything was created, both in the heavenly realm and on earth. All that is seen and all that is unseen, every seat of power, realm of government, principality, and authority, it was all created through him and for his purpose. He existed before anything was made, and now everything finds completion in him. He is the head of his body, which is the church. And since he is the beginning of and the firstborn heir in resurrection. So he's the firstborn heir. So we see heir again. He is the most exalted one, holding first place in everything. For God is satisfied to have all his fullness dwelling in Christ. So Jesus Christ was a man and a a human, and All of God's fullness was in Christ. And by the blood of his cross, everything in heaven and earth is brought back to himself, back to its original intent, restored to innocence again. So like by his blood, we owe nothing, we are back to innocence. I had, like, chapters. (laughs) It was like I can't read chapters, so I'm trying to have to, like, go through here, so I'm sorry. Okay. Even though you were once distant from him, living in the shadows of your evil thoughts and actions, he reconnected you back to himself. He released his supernatural peace to you through the sacrifice of his own body as the sin payment on your behalf so that you would dwell in his presence. So we could dwell in his presence. And now there is nothing between you and Father God. For he sees you as holy. Remember how I said at the beginning, we are holy. For he sees you as holy, flawless, and restored. I do like the next scripture there. It says, if indeed you continue to advance in faith, assured of a firm foundation to grow upon, never be shaken from the hope of the gospel you have believed in. And faith and believed are kind of also on what I'm on. (laughs) So now I'm going to go to Ephesians. Maybe if 
I can find it. Ephesians 1, and I'm just going to quote verse 11. It says, through our union with Christ, we too have been claimed by God as his own inheritance. So through our union with Christ, through our faith, through our belief that he actually died and paid the price for everything, we have been claimed by God as his own inheritance. So I'm going to skip to 22 and 1. It says, And he alone is the leader and the source of everything needed in the church. So Christ. Christ alone is the leader and the source of everything needed in the church. God has put everything beneath the authority of Jesus Christ and has given him the highest rank above all others the highest rank above all others. So not just in spiritual and principalities and other kings, but like as he is saying, we are heirs, we are holy. Uh, we are, if an heir is a king, pretty much, or priest, it's in the priesthood. Um, so Jesus has the highest rank because he was the firstborn. So now we are, we, his church, are his body on the earth and that which fills him who is being filled by it. So we are Christ's body on the earth, that which fills him. So as we come to him, it's also filling him, and we're also being filled by it. I hope I said that right. So then I'm going to come over here. I'm going to skip all around in Ephesians. so. So now in Ephesians 2... Four, it says, but God still loved us with such a great love. He is so rich in compassion and mercy. Even when we were dead and doomed in our many sins, he united us into the very life of Christ and saved us by his wonderful grace. He united us into the very life of Christ and saved us by his wonderful grace. He raised us up with Christ as the exalted one. And we ascended with him into the glorious perfection and authority of the heavenly realm. For we are now co-seated as one with Christ. There is um, a lot of beliefs that nobody can get close to the Father, nobody can have a relationship with the Father, And all of these scriptures are pointing to the fact of what Jesus did. He allowed us, by by him surrendering his life as the payment for sin, it has bought us redemption to have intimacy, to have relationship with not only the Father, but with God and the Holy Spirit, too. So we are now co-seated as one with Christ. Through the coming ages, we, we, will be the visible display of the infinite, limitless riches of his grace and kindness, which was showered upon us in Jesus Christ. So because of what Jesus Christ did on the cross, on the cross, as we continually submit ourselves to Jesus, when we said, God, I give, you our, I give you my heart and I believe, I believe that what Jesus did on the cross covered it all, we are being transformed into the image of God. And so since we are being transformed into the image of God, we are kings, we are heirs, we are holy, and we are revealing his glory on earth. So 
So in this one, it's still it's in chapter two, verse eleven. It, it there's a little thingy there at the top that says new new humanity. If I can remember, <laughs> now I got a mess up. New humanity. <laughs> oh God. Okay. It says so. Don't forget that you were not born as Jews. See, Jews were the only ones that could get close to God before because. That was the ones that he had a covenant with. So it says, don't forget that you were not born as Jews and were uncircumcised. Circumcision itself is just a work of man's hand. You had none of the Jewish covenants and laws. You were foreigners to Israel's incredible heritage. You were without the covenants and the prophetic promises of the Messiah, the promised hope, and without God. Yet look at you now. Everything is new. Although you were once distant and far away from God, now you have been brought delightfully close to him through the sacred blood of Jesus. You have actually been united to Christ. A reconciling peace is Jesus. He has made Jew and non-Jew one in Christ by dying as our, as our sacrifice. He has broken down every wall of prejudice that separated us and has made us equal through our union with Christ. Ethnic hatred has been dissolved by the crucifixion of his precious body on the cross. The legal code that stood condemning every one of us, non-Jews, has now been repealed by his command. His tri triune essence has made peace between us by st starting over, forming one new race of humanity. <laughs> humanity. Okay. <laughs> okay. Jews and non-Jews fused together. Two have now become one. And we live restored to God and reconciled in the body of Christ. Through his crucifixion, hatred died. For the Messiah has come to preach the sweet message of peace to you. The, one, the ones who were distant and the ones who are near. And now because we are united to Christ, we both have equal and direct access in the realm of the Holy Spirit to come before the Father. So you are not foreigners, our guests, but rather you are the children of the city of the Holy Ones. So there's holy again. So we are the children of the city of the Holy Ones. With all of the rights as family members of the household of God. So we have all of the rights all the promises, all the covenants of the household of God because we have been united. You are rising like the perfectly fitted stones of the temple and your lives are being built up together upon the ideal foundation laid by the apostles and the prophets. And best of all, you are connected to the head cornerstone of the building, the anointed one, Jesus Christ himself. This entire building is under construction and is continually growing. We're increasing from glory to glory to glory. So it's continually growing under his supervision until it rises up completed as the holy temple of the Lord himself. So as we all come together and we are submitting ourselves and we're pressing on into the faith and into the righteousness because there's a scripture that says to seek righteousness and then all these things shall come. So as we're doing this, that is building the temple, the Lord himself. This means that God is transforming each one of you into the holy of holies. Who's the holy of holies? He is transforming us into the holy of holies his dwelling place, through the power of the Holy Spirit living in you. I'm going to go to Romans. Let me 
Romans 3, 26. Okay, there's, there's one spot here. I like what it says at the beginning, but I don't necessarily understand what it means in the middle. But the <laughs> So if anybody wants to interject there. <laughs> um, so I'll start over here. Okay, Jesus, God's given destiny was to be sacrificed to take away our sins. And now he is our, he is our mercy seat. Because of his death on the cross, we come to him for mercy. For God has made provision for us to be given by faith in the sacred blood of Jesus. So God made a provision for us to be saved or to be forgiven by the faith in the sacred blood of Jesus. So if we believe that Jesus' blood covered it, then we're forgiven. This is the perfect demonstration of God's justice because until now, he has been so patient, holding back his justice out of his tolerance for us. See, that's the part that, like, gets me because he's a loving God so that I don't necessarily understand. So he covered over the sins of those who lived prior to Jesus' sacrifice. And when the season of tolerance came to an end, there was only one possible way for God to give away his righteousness and still be true to both his justice and his mercy. You know, we always are like, well, why can't God just get it done and over with already? He had to be true to his justice and his mercy. mercy. And so that's why he made the provision of Jesus Christ. So now because we stand on the faithfulness of Jesus, God declares us righteous in his eyes. Where then is there room for boasting? Do our works bring God's acceptance? Not at all. It was not our works of keeping the law, but our faith in his finished work that makes us right with God. So there's faith again. So our faith in his finished work that makes us right with God. So our faith that Jesus' blood was sacred and covered it all makes it right with God. Anyway, move on. <laughs> oh, gosh. So our conclusion to this, God's wonderful declaration that we are righteousness in his eyes, in his eyes can only, sorry, my eyes crossed. God's wonderful declaration that we are righteous in his eyes can only come when we put our faith in Christ and not keeping the law. Oh. Okay, so I want to read that over again because I was, like, putting the spaces or the pause in wrong. But it says, um, God's wonderful declaration that we are righteous in his eyes can only come when we put our faith in Christ and not in keeping the law. I went to the wrong scripture, but okay, we'll keep going. After all, is God the God of Jews only? Or is he, equal, or is he equally the God for all humanity? Of course he's the God of all people. Since there is only one God, he will treat us all the same. 
He eliminates our guilt and makes us right with him by faith, no matter who we are. Does emphasizing our faith invalidate the law? Absolutely not. Instead, our faith establishes the role the law should rightfully have. So as we believe and as we hear what God is saying, it establishes the things in us that it's part of his nature and character. K4, Romans 4. Listen to what the scripture says. Because Abraham believed God's word, because Abraham believed God's words, his faith transferred God's righteousness into his account. When he believed, because Abraham believed God's words, his faith transferred. God's righteousness into his account. So our faith in Jesus, our faith like in Jesus' blood that, that, that paid the price, our faith in hearing what God is saying in each moment that transfers us as righteous. When people work, they earn wages. It can't be considered a free gift because they earn it. But no one earns God's righteousness. It can only be transferred when we no longer rely on our own works, but believe in the one who powerfully declares the ungodly to be righteous in his eyes. It is faith that transfers God's righteousness into your account. I could have read all of these script, like all of these chapters, but it was like, okay. <laughs> I was trying to pick out the little spots where it was talking about the righteousness and the faith, and 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 to show like where it says like we are holy and we are um, being transformed into the image of God. Okay, so Romans five. Our faith in Jesus transferred God's righteousness to us as he now declares us flawless in his eyes. This means we can now enjoy true and lasting peace with God, all because of what our Lord Jesus, the Anointed One, has done for us. Our faith guarantees us permanent access into this marvelous kindness that has given us a perfect relationship with God. What incredible joy bursts forth within us as we keep on celebrating our hope of experiencing God's glory. But that's not all. Even in times of trouble, we have a joyful confidence knowing that our pressures will develop us into patient, will develop in us patience, patient endurance. And patient endurance will refine our character. And proven character leads us back to hope. And this hope is not a disappointing fantasy. Because we now experience the endless love of God cascading into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who lives in us. For when the time was right, the anointed one came and died to demonstrate his love for sinners who were entirely helpless, weak, and powerless to save themselves. Now who of us would dare to die for the sake of a wicked person? We can all understand.
And if someone was willing to die for a truly noble person, but Christ proved God's passionate love for us by dying in our place while we were still lost and ungodly. And there is still much more to say of his unfailing love for us. For through the blood of Jesus, we have heard the powerful declaration, you are now righteous in my sight. And because of the sacrifice of Jesus, you will never experience the wrath of God. So while, so if while we were still enemies, God fully reconciled us to himself through the death of his son, then something greater than friendship is ours. Now that we are at peace with God, and because we share in his resurrection life, how much more will we be rescued from sin's dominion? And even more than that, we overflow with triumphant joy in our new relationship of living in harmony with God, all because of Jesus Christ. Living in harmony with God, we're no longer God's enemy, all because of Jesus. When Adam sinned and entered when Adam sinned, the entire world was affected. Sin entered human experience, and death was the result. And so death followed this sin, casting its shadow over all humanity, because all have sinned. Sin was in the world before Moses gave the written law, but it was not charged against them, but it was not charged against them where no law existed. Yet death reigned. As king from Adam to Moses, even though they hadn't broken a command the way Adam had, the first man, Adam, was a picture of the Messiah who was to come. Now there is no comparison between Adam's transgressions and the gracious gifts that we experience, for the magnitude of the gift far outweighs the crime. It is true that many die because of one man's transgressions, but how much greater will God's grace and his gracious gift of acceptance overflow to many because of what one man Jesus the Messiah did for us. And this free-flowing gift imparts to us much more than what was given to us through the one who sinned. For because of one transgression, we were all facing a death sentence with a verdict of guilty. But this gracious gift leaves us free from our, from our many failures and brings us into the perfect righteousness of God acquitted with the words, not guilty. Now over in 6, it says, For by his sacrifice he died to sin's power once and for all, but he now lives continuously for the Father's pleasure. For by his sacrifice, he died to sin's power once and for all. But now he lives continuously for the Father's pleasure. So let it be the same way with you. Since you are now joined with him, you must continually view yourselves as dead 
and unresponsive to sin's appeal while living daily for God's pleasure and union with Jesus Christ, the Anointed One. Sin is a dethroned monarch, so you must no longer give it an opportunity to rule over your life, controlling how you live, and compelling you to obey its desires and cravings. So then refuse to answer its call to surrender your body as a tool for wickedness. Instead, passionately answer God's call to keep yielding your body to him as one who has now experienced resurrection life. You live now for his pleasure, ready to be used for his noble purpose. Remember, this sin will not conquer you, for God already has. You're not governed by law, but you are governed by the reign of the grace of God. Are you guys following along, or am I too much all over the place? I really wish you'd give me words sometimes other than just, like, reading this. But I'm really honored to read it, too. Sorry, okay. Romans 8. 19, the entire universe is standing on tiptoe, yearning to see the unveiling of God's glorious sons and daughters. Over in verse 27, you know, the entire universe is standing on tiptoe yearning to see the unveiling of God's glorious sons and daughters. When are we going to believe? When are we going to stop fighting all the things that we don't need to be fighting and just focus in on righteousness? Because as we focus in on righteousness, we are his body on earth, and we are his sons and daughters. We are his heirs. And the whole universe is waiting God is the searcher of the heart, knows fully our longings, yet he also understands the desires of the Spirit because the Holy Spirit passionately passionately pleads before God for us, his holy ones, in perfect harmony with God's plan and our destiny. So we are convinced that every detail of our lives is continually woven together to fit into God's perfect plan of bringing good into our lives. For we are his lovers who have been called to fulfill his designed purpose. For he knew about us before we were born, and he destined us from the beginning to share the likeness of his son. This means the son is the oldest among a vast family of brothers and sisters who will become like him. Having determined our destiny ahead of time, he called us to himself and transferred his perfect righteousness. He transferred his perfect righteousness into everyone called. And those who pose his perfect righteousness or sorry, possess, sorry, and those who possess his perfect righteousness, he co-glorified with his son. There's a, a spot where it says that God would not share his glory with another. We're not another. Because of what Jesus did, we're no longer another. We are in unity with him. So he can share his glory with us. (sighs) 
I read in so many places, and it was just like the salvation, the salvation that we're calling up now. It's like calling up on the, what's the word? The promises, the declaration, what the covenant. We're calling up on salvation now. Like, we're calling up on salvation now. Though we may be surrounded and pressed from all sides, we can focus in on righteousness and call up that salvation. I'm not saying to work anything up, but it's just like, Letting that life flow. Stop letting the enemy bombard you and beat you down and saying no, that no one can see his face. No one can share in his glory. But it's that calling up of salvation of the faith, of hearing his voice and believing Believing what he says is true. So that it's... God, I just pray that you just go through and wherever there's confusion with the things that I've spoken, God, that you just speak clarity. You speak clarity and your life gets to flow through. And anybody that's held in bondage that says that they can't get close to God, that there is no relationship, that only Jesus was the one that could have the relationship or the high priest. God, I just call for them walls to be broken down. And the life to spring forth and to realize the rec... rec <laughs> Why can't I have words? The recognition of who we are in you. Who we are in you, God. There's so much more to this. There's so much more to this than what I can convey. I thank you for your goodness, God. I thank you for your love. You loved us so much. You loved us so much. There was two ways set forth in the Bible to obtain righteousness. One was through Adam and one was through Moses. Through Adam, it was because he believed. By faith, he believed. And through Moses, it was through the law. And even Moses himself could not obtain righteousness. And so you sent Jesus. You provided the atonement of our sins to cover out any debt that could ever be thrown in for condemnation and stuff like that. And so if we believe by faith and hearing your voice, there's freedom. That's all I have. Oh, <laughs> I met Abraham. <laughs> I can't even say my words. <laughs> Abraham, not Adam. By his faith. By his faith he believed and it was counted to him as righteousness. By his faith he believed and it was counted to him as righteousness. That same thing is available. It's available for all of us. And we get the option to choose. 
And he paid the price, and he says, will you just believe? Will you just believe? You don't have to go through all the pain. You don't have to go through all the suffering. There is pain and suffering and surrendering your life, but not in the way that condemnation and sin and guilt and all that stuff just pushes you down and kills you and chokes the life out of you. Choose life by believing. Okay. Anybody? Thank you, God.